Good evening, everybody. We always try to start on time, also in The Hague. So if everybody could just quickly go and try to find a nice spot, we can start. And you could fill up all the empty spaces now, I think, so everybody could have a good view. Yeah, take a seat. You always have to take your chance. <laughs> well, it's great to see you all here in the Nieuwe Kerk. Good evening again. It's a great moment to welcome you here for our first event in The Hague. When the West Holland Foreign Investment Office here in The Hague called me and asked me to consider to have John Adams Institute lectures or events in this city, I first sighed that I was already so busy with our programs in Amsterdam, of course. But what a Dutch way to react. Very quickly, I returned to my senses and I took it the American way and immediately saw the great advantages of having programs in this town. It helped me tremendously when not only the West Holland Foreign Investment Office, but also the city, The Hague, and bookseller Pragman decided to invest in this project. I do hope that from this evening on, you can find many, we can find many more partners to be able to bring great people to this wonderful city of peace and justice. My name is Monique Knappen, and I am the director of the John Adams Institute. Tonight, we're very proud to present an evening with Jane Fonda, she wrote a book about her own life, my life so far. Her publisher in Holland, Leuting Seidhoff, made a beautiful translation, Mein Leven, and I want to thank them for helping me to make this evening possible. In a moment, Jane Fonda will speak about her book, but before this, Jan Donkers will introduce Ms. Fonda. Jan Donkers is a journalist, a writer, and an American scholar, and an old friend of the John Adams Institute. He moderated Eric Schlosser only last week, but also interviewed Madeleine Albright for us, to mention two previous guests. About the layout of tonight, first we'll have the introduction done by Jan Donkers, then we'll have Ms. Vonda here on stage to speak to us. After this, she will go in straight into a discussion with Jan Donkers without an intermission, and at a certain moment, Jan will ask you to interfere as the audience. We will end the program. It depends a little bit on how long Jane is going to stay with us, but something around 9.15, 9.30. There are books for sale. I believe they're all signed, but she cannot sign more books tonight. Um, but I will be back to tell you a little bit more about our next programs before I can leave you all. Um, Jan, may I ask you to take the floor? Thank you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, at this first event of uh, the John Adams Institute in The Hague. Um, Jane Fonda arrived uh, on Schiphol Airport a couple of days ago, uh, days ago on her own, without family or entourage, with just her little dog, who we will also see in a little while, who ha had got sick on the flight. An elegant, petite woman walking with a cane because of her hip but fully in control of, as she describes it in her book, the third act of her life. It made me uh, think back of the 70s when I first started traveling the United States to cover political campaigns and the Watergate hearings. And everywhere I came, there seemed to be people on airports and near the entrance of events, carrying posters with the most obscene hurting of texts directed at this same woman so aggressively violent that I was shocked. I loved and admired the United States of America more than my own country, and I remember being so disgusted by what I saw. How could people in this country that I so admired bear such hatred, 
such vituperation directed at a woman just for speaking her mind, actively striving for peace, for trying to end a war that, in her view, was an unjust war, like many of us were thinking at the time. It did not end, of course, with these loonies uh, at the airport and other places. The FBI spent immense amounts of taxpayer money at following her around, tapping her phone, and generally trying to discredit her in the public eye. She describes this period vividly in her memoirs called My Life So Far, that, as Monique pointed out, also appeared in Dutch recently. It is an extremely candid and a courageous book that, in a way, as I saw it described in some reviews, is a very typical American story of a person looking for and fighting for self-fulfillment, spending a good part of a lifetime trying to discover who she is. Even now you can see obscene or violent bumper stickers bearing her name, but the wonderful thing is, and it ties in with the reasons why it is, in my opinion, impossible uh, not to love the United States, that all the hatred never really hampered her career. On the contrary, her most memorable films she made after the Hanoi J Jane campaign, both of the Oscars she won were after that, Clute and Coming Home. And when she started producing the workout videos that uh, made her popular, her more popular than ever, nobody would have predicted that uh, one of them would turn out to be the best sold video in the history of uh, uh, in the United States ever, 17 million copies. So here we have that question again. Are there really two Americas? One that thinks that a vengeful Jesus Christ is, Christ is the only God to be worshipped? that says abortion and homosexuality are sinful, that says it is perfectly all right to promote and defend American military and economical hegemony worldwide, and another America that strongly disagrees with all these assumptions. Or in other words, one America that loves, that, that hates Jane Fonda, and one America that admires and loves Jane Fonda. I personally don't think uh, that this is a correct picture, but maybe we can address it later on in the evening. Here we have Jane Fonda's book, in which she describes her journey so far, her career, her man, her insecurity, her doubts, her agony, her anger, and her happiness. More and more happiness as she grew into the person she is now. You would not say it if you looked at her now, but she was one mixed up shook up girl for most of her life. And the realization that she was resulted, among many other things, in this wonderful book. We will talk about the book, but as Monique pointed out, you are encouraged, encouraged to ask questions yourself. The mics are over here. If you feel embarrassed to stand up in public, you can hand a, 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 a written question, legibly please, uh, to me, and I will see what I can do uh, with it. Enough of my introduction. It is a pleasure and a great honor to give to you Miss Jane Fonda. I just got a new hip. That's why I'm using a cane. Um, it's hell growing old. Oh, God. Um, thank you. Where are you? You've disappeared. Thank you for the... Uh, <laughs> thank you for, for that introduction. I am honored to be the inaugural speaker for the John Adams Institute in The Hague. Um, and I want to thank the city of The Hague for, for doing this and for being so welcoming to me. I, I must say, I, I've been in Holland before. Um, I've been in Amsterdam before. I've never been in The Hague, but people have been so, so friendly, and I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, actually, my ancestors came from northern Holland. They were names like Jelles, Jelles, J-E-L-L-E-S, and Dow, and Peter, P-I-E-T-E-R, and things like that and they left and came to America in the early 1700s. So I feel sort of connected to, to this country. Um, I, I've got my dog here because she'll cry if, if she's sitting out in the audience and, and sees me up here. By the way, I have the local soccer team 
scarf on. I want everyone to appreciate it. <laughs> um, when I was 59 years old, I realized with some shock that in a year I was going to be 60. And I'm no fool. I, don't, I know I'm not going to live much past my 90s, so I realized this is my last act. You know, the first 30 years, the second 30 years, and then the last act. And you don't have to be a, a, an, an actor to know the importance of third acts. You know, have you ever been to a play where you, you see the first two acts and you think, what on earth was that playwright thinking? I mean, what was that about? And then along comes the third act and you say, oh, God, brilliant. I understand what all that was about. Well. I realized that I wasn't scared of dying. I had watched my father 20 years before as he died, and it made me realize that, that, that there's something worse than dying, and that's getting to the end of life with a lot of regrets. I could tell that he had regrets, and it was very painful for me to know that he had not been able to resolve them before he died and that was something that I wanted to do and then I realized well what or I, I thought what, what are those regrets going to be I'm not so sure and to figure out what they would be I knew that I would have to go back and and figure out and understand the first two acts is she she's distracting everybody <laughs> Tulia shut up and sit down if she doesn't, uh, maybe Crystal can take her outside. She's just been outside, so I know she doesn't. God, if she poops in front of everybody. <laughs> anyway, um, I knew that I had to understand the first two acts of my life in order to figure out how, what I was supposed to do in the third act. See, I didn't want to be like Christopher Columbus, who didn't know where he was going when he left, didn't know where he was when he got there, and didn't know where he'd been when he got home. <laughs> so I spent a year. I actually, I decided that to really do it, and to do it objectively, I would make a little video of my life, you know, 25-minute video um, of my life that I would show to people on my 60th birthday. And it forced me to really understand uh, what, what my life had been about. I asked my daughter, who's a documentary filmmaker, she's the mother of my two grandchildren at the time, I asked her to help me edit the video. And she said to me, why don't you just get a chameleon to crawl across the screen? <laughs> but I knew that that's the rap on me, you know. There's no there there. I'm only a, a, a puppet for whatever man I'm with. And I, I needed to figure out whether that was true. And I had to own up to it if it was true. When I, when I finally arrived at my 60th birthday, and I strongly encourage people to be very intentional about aging. It's, it makes all the difference in the world. You know, I invited a few of my friends who are slightly older than me to come to my birthday. One of them is famous. Actually, I'll, no, I won't say his name. But he said, are you kidding? I went into hiding for my 60th birthday. And another friend said, I slept through mine. Not a good idea. It's very good to live with the awareness of death. It's very good towards the end of your life in the last act to be aware that th this is it. And it's not a dress rehearsal. Better get it right. Getting it right for me, I realized, meant that I had to somehow learn to be as brave in my private, intimate life as I was in my public, political life. And I also realized that there was a story that ran through my life that was rather universal. It's the story of a person who grew up feeling she wasn't good enough that to be loved you have to be perfect. And that's a terrible thing to want to be because we're human beings. We're not meant to be perfect. We're meant to be complete. That's what our search should be for, the search for completion. What happens to girls, and I've discovered that this is not just a girl thing, this is also a boy thing. You're not man enough, you know, you're not tough enough, you're, you're, you, you're too emotional, you're not competitive enough. 
not good enough. It's a terrible thing. Be a good girl, which inherently means you're, that you're not good, <laughs> that there's something about you that's bad that you have to get rid of. Well, reaching adolescence, usually the getting rid of attaches itself to your body. You're not good enough. You don't look right. You're not thin enough, or you're not buxom enough, or you're not this, or you're not that. And what happens to young people, especially young girls? They become disembodied. I did. I moved out of myself. I took up residence next door. I would move back in sometimes when I was alone or when I was with my women friends, but most of the time I was living next door. I could be very courageous politically eventually when I got some sense in my head. Um, but when it came to walking through that door into the closed rooms with men, I, I, I lost my, my courage. And that's what happens to young girls who, who, who were made to feel that they weren't good enough. So I'm now 60 and I'm realizing that there is a there there. That, that, that there is a, a, a thread that runs through my life that is consistent. Um, that I am a strong person and, a, and an able person and a brave person and I deserve to be loved and that I want for the first time in my life to move back in. And, uh, and the problem was, see, and I'd made a deal with myself to not have regrets. And I knew that if I didn't do this and move back into myself and say to my husband, who I love very much, this is who I am, that I would regret it. Problem was that he didn't want me to move back in. <laughs> he liked me better when I was living over here and only brought the perfect part of me to the table. And that's a very interesting thing for a woman. I was at the time 62 years old. It's not that I depended on any men financially. I didn't. Usually I supported them. Well, not Ted Turner, but... <laughs> but uh, uh, I did love him, and I still do. But there was a choice to be made. You know, there was this one angel like Virginia Woolf who had, you know, the angel in the house sitting on her shoulder going, oh, no, 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 no. You're good women. You don't say that. You don't write that. Be a good girl. Well, I had one angel on one shoulder saying, don't rock the boat. You know, everything's fine. The guy's rich and he's nice and he's generous and he's interesting. And, you know, just leave it the way it is. But then I had this other angel on the other shoulder saying, you know something? If you stay in this situation, you're going to die married, but without ever having the courage to own your voice within an intimate relationship. And I will regret that. And I realized right then, I have to go. But there's no road map, is there? I mean, there's not a lot of road maps for women of a certain age when they, for the first time, decide that they're going to be alone. So it was scary. But I learned something really important at that time. After a lifelong effort to be perfect, I learned that good enough is good enough. And that's become my mantra. I also learned that for whatever mysterious reason, some of us are resilient and some aren't, that I was born with the sense that it's more important to be interested than interesting. I've always stayed curious. Now, um, this thing about Christianity that was mentioned in the introduction. I think I'm going to talk a little bit about that because, um, you know, we're in a church. I was raised an atheist. Nobody in the Fonda family. We, we fled northern Holland and came to New York for reasons of, of religious persecution. My ancestors founded the Dutch Reformed Church in Fonda, New York. But somewhere along the way, don't want anything to do with the metaphysical, don't want anything to do with religion. It's just a crutch, like psychotherapy and acting classes and, you know, just, you know, just move along on your own and you don't need anything like that. Well, you know, I said that I moved out of myself. The reason I'm talking about me is because this is quite universal, which is why I wrote my book. This isn't just the story of some movie star. 
I've had so many people in the state say, I can't believe that you wrote my life. It's a very universal thing. Um, so I describe moving out. And what happens to a young girl, and it usually happens to girls in adolescence, they move out of themselves after discovering that they're not good enough, and it leaves you empty. And you fill the emptiness with, I don't know what you do in The Hague. In the States, you shop. <laughs> oh, if I only had that purse, everything would be okay. You know. If I only had that boyfriend, everything would be okay. And I'll do just about anything he wants, so he'll ask me out on a second date. Or, you know, or drugs, smoking pot. Well, God, I mean, I'm in Holland. <laughs> you know, that'll fill the emptiness. That'll numb the anxiety that comes when you're empty inside. If you think of yourself as a chalice, fill it with something. Alcohol, gambling, sex, workaholism, whatever. I filled it with food. I was a food addict. Bulimia anorexic. It probably doesn't exist in Holland, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, this I, I I I was always looking to fill the emptiness, and for a long time I filled it with an addiction, and and then I had to make a choice, life or death, and I decided to stop the addiction. I mean, I just stopped, but the emptiness was still there, and. Something strange began to happen to me in my 50s. I, I began, began to feel the emptiness filling with reverence. If my father knew, he would die all over again. <laughs> I'm not supposed to feel that. What is this that I feel? I felt that I was being led. I felt a need for the metaphysical. I felt the need for the spiritual. And I, because of Ted Turner, I moved to Georgia, where everyone is Christian. And most of the Christians are quite fundamentalist. <laughs> and I felt a need to become a Christian. I didn't tell Ted because I knew he'd talk me out of it. He once said Christianity is a religion for losers. And I understood why he said that. The more I studied the Bible, the more I thought, God, I've made a terrible mistake. I didn't leave a patriarchal marriage to get into a patriarchal religion. What have I done? But then I began to study the early Christians. I began to study what was written that was kept out of the Bible. You know, in the fourth century, Constantine who had become a Christian and was defending the Christian religion decided, got together all these bishops and they decided what was going to be in the Bible and what wasn't. And what's really interesting is to see what was kept out. And almost all the things that were kept out had to do with women, had to do with the power of that which is feminine in men and women. Jesus actually said in the, in, the, in, in the Gospel of Thomas, which is 114 sayings that he was supposed to have said that were like riddles. He said, number 22, the statement number 22, he said, you can enter the kingdom of God when man becomes woman and woman becomes man. And a lot of theologians and biblical scholars are scratching their head thinking, what does that mean? Right? I, I think I know what it means. I think the divine purpose is to create a real balance between all the wonderful things that men are and all the wonderful things women are, and that's what Jesus represented. Of course, if he came to the United States now, you know who would say, oh my God, he's gay. <laughs> that hair, those robes, the disciples, forget it. I mean, you know who I'm talking about. But actually, Jesus was a great feminist. It was like that what, what is what he was here for. And feminism doesn't mean, and it's, it's a gender neutral term. What it means is that no matter what gender we are, we are fully realized as human beings. And that we respect each other. You know, the, the way I put it before I became a Christian, I used to say, what I want to do with my life is help women regain their voices and men regain their hearts. And then I realized that's what Jesus was teaching. 
In the early Christians, they worshipped a god that was a dyad, a duality, the divine mother and the divine father. They viewed the feminine part of it. It was called Sophia. And in the Bible, nobody pays attention to it, but Christ actually says, I was born of Sophia. And depending on the version of the Bible you read, you know, one will say, you are not, I'm paraphrasing, you are not listening to the one who writhed in labor to give birth to you. That's God speaking. But in the New Bibles it says, you're not listening to the one who fathered you. It's very different. It's very different. And the more I study this and the more I um, travel and, and, and learn about this and talk to other people, the more I feel that the main problem in the world, if you go right down to the core, is the imbalance that is coming about now more and more increasingly um, between the masculine and the feminine. It's very acute in America. It's very acute. You know, I, for years I couldn't understand why one administration after another who knew, if you read the Pentagon Papers, they knew they couldn't win. John Kennedy knew before he was assassinated that we couldn't win any more than the French did in Vietnam. And yet they stayed. And yet they kept, kept sending young American men to die in Vietnam, even though they knew that we couldn't win. And in his, when he was talking to his autobiographer, to his biographer, Doris Kern, President Lyndon Johnson said, if I pulled out, they'd think I was an unmanly man. And that says it all to me. It says it all. Premature evacuation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is not an option in a patriarchal world. Better to lose lives than to say this is wrong and we're going to admit it and we're going to learn from it and we're going to get out. And now we see it being repeated again in Iraq with phrases like, bring them on, my God's bigger than yours. Actually one of our top generals said that, my God, our God is bigger than theirs. Come and get me. I mean, you know, cowboy mentality. Only we're not a frontier anymore. That kind of mentality was fine when there were vast expanses that we could expand into and, you know, and claim for our own. We're, we're too small a globe now, as you all here in The Hague know better than anybody. It's a small world. And we have to really do what Jesus taught. We have to love our neighbors as ourselves. That is the main totally revolutionary teaching of Jesus Christ that is being distorted in the United States now. And it's a, and it's, it's a, it's a terrible thing what's happening. So anyway, what else can I say? <laughs> um, I didn't become engagé, I didn't become an activist until I was in my early 30s, right after I made Barbarella. <laughs> and I feel now, and especially this came clear to me as I was writing my book, I feel that I was supposed to be in France in 1968. My book, you know, because I saw my life in three acts, my second act, my first act is called Gathering because it's in the first 30 years that you gather the tools that make you who you are and also the wounds and the scars. The second act is called Seeking because literally 1968 was the beginning of my, I, I turned 30, it was a terrible time. I was pregnant. I turned 30. I had the mumps and Faye Dunaway just got the part of Bonnie and Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> it was awful. But I was pregnant with my daughter but also with myself and I was in Paris in 1968. First there was the Tet Offensive. I had been, my father fought in the Second World War. I believed that our country was on the side of the angels that if our flag was flying someplace, it was on the side of the angels. I was a believer. And I hated being an American in France with everybody saying to me, because they knew they'd been there before us. You know, they had their asses whooped before us. You know, uh-uh, you're not going to do it. Sorry, you're not going to win. And I thought, well, it's sour grapes just because they lost. They think we can't win. I didn't understand. 
And I remember Vadim saying in, in 65, right at, at when the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was passed, which permitted Johnson to bomb North Vietnam, he said, you're crazy. You people in Congress, you're just nuts. There's no way. And I thought, how come a French director? What does he know? Suddenly, 1968 and the Tet Offensive, and I thought, oh, my God. Why? What is this? What does it mean? What does it mean to be an American when we are being whooped by a small agrarian country of peasants and fishermen? And then the events of May, Les Événements de May. Do you remember? Things were happening all over the world. This coalition of workers and students almost toppled the de Gaulle government, and I was pregnant. And suddenly, my eyes began to turn outwards. And I began to, I sort of, bec I became the characters from my father's movies. You know, I think, I once met R Martin Luther King's daughter, Yolanda King, and, and I asked her, I said, did your father used to t take you on his knees and teach you about life and values and how to live life? And she said, no, no, he never did. And I said, no, my father never did either, but you have your father's sermons, and I have my father's films. Tom Joad, Young Abe Lincoln, Oxbow Incident, you know, Grapes of Wrath, Twelve Angry Men, The Wrong Man. Iconic characters who cared about justice. And that entered my DNA. He didn't have to speak to me. And at 68 was where the, all those seeds that had been buried began to bear fruit, and I began to, to look at the world and, and, and came home. You know, they always say, you're a communist, go home, go back to Hanoi. I came home. You know, it's, you, you go home if you want to fight for your country and, and try to, you know, make things better. And yes, there, were, there was a lot of controversy, and yes, I made mistakes, and yes, there's pe people that still hate me, but man, I'm glad I'm not still Barbarella, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, I can see the movie and enjoy it, but it took me a while. And I, maybe, I w maybe it was supposed to take me a while. And it took me a while to realize that good enough is good enough. And I just, I feel that I'm, that I'm, that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I do a lot of traveling, and I want to tell you something. You're the friendliest people I've come upon. You, you, you're just, in, you know, I've met hundreds of you now, both here and in, and in Amsterdam, and so welcoming and so warm and so sweet and friendly and nice, and, and uh, I'd like to think there's some of that in our genes, the Fondas, along with the repressive Calvinist, don't show your emotions and all that stuff. <laughs> but uh, it's a, you know, it's a very interesting thing now to be a, a feminist Christian living in Georgia, a, a country that very much su push, supports George Bush. But I'm very grateful to my favorite ex-husband, Ted Turner, who brought me there, because if you really want to make a difference, you can't do it in Hollywood. Because the middle of the country said, say to you quite rightly, well, you know, that's, you're out of touch, and we are. It wasn't until I moved to the Southeast that I really began to understand that they were right. You have, to, you have to be away from people who are famous and rich with a lot of facelifts and things to understand what life is like in America. You know, you can't be on the top of the mountain. You have to be down, down below. And, and, uh, and I know that, that, that if I can change anything in, in Georgia, I can change it anywhere. <laughs> Forced me to live. So what I, what I started to do in 1995, I began an organization. I didn't know why, but I felt called to work with young people because we're not like here in, in Holland, in, in the United States. And we always point to Holland as a great example of how it should be. We don't teach our kids how to take care of themselves. We don't talk about contraception. We don't talk because... The ruling party right now thinks if you talk to children about contraception, they're going to become promiscuous. And we say, but look at Holland, you know, and look at Sweden. They're not having any more sex than we are, and they talk about contraception very openly in schools. They teach their children because they come to it from a, from a health perspective, not a moral perspective. And as a result, your young people have just as much sex, but they don't have as much AIDS. 
and they don't have babies when they're 12 and 13 and 14 years old when they're still babies themselves. And I, and I felt called to work with these kids because I realized early on that the reason that children do things that they shouldn't do and risk dying of AIDS or risk getting pregnant when they're little babies is because they see no future. Hope is the best contraceptive. And I work with very poor kids. The poorest of them are white in North Georgia, which is like a third world country. Poor and the richest country in the world. Well, you saw a little bit of it when, when you watched television when the Hurricane Katrina came through. You know, to me, how I see that, God gave us a first gulf, the Gulf War, and we didn't learn. And so God gave us a second gulf in Mississippi, the, Mex the Gulf of Mexico, and said, okay, now, do you get it? Do you get it? There's nobody home. The emperor has no clothes. If you're poor, nobody cares. It was terrifying to be an American sitting in front of the television set for five days and nobody did anything. And we're not Pakistan, we're not Kashmir. It was scary. But I know about poor people because I work with them and, and I feel like it's what I've been called to do. And it's not rocket science. You know, it's not very complicated. It's, it's about love. It's about seeing children and letting them know you think that, that they count that they're good enough and being there for them. And that's what we do in, in Georgia. And hopefully we're, we're creating a model. And then we, because I was not a good parent, one of the other things we do is we train parents how to be parents. If you weren't parented when you were little, you don't know how to be a parent for your child. And so we teach them how to do it. It's really fun and it's not difficult. And when a mother learns how to be a parent, then, uh, Everything becomes easy. I better stop. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, and I'm going to uh, thank you all for being here, and now I guess we're going to have a dialogue. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jane, for preempting almost all of my questions. <laughs> um, First of all, um, I know that you uh, wrote the book yourself without the help of a ghostwriter, as is usual in, in uh, uh, well, in Hollywood. Most of the uh, autobiographies are ghostwritten. Uh, you wrote it yourself, and I was wondering because many of the details are so extremely vivid. Did you keep a diary all those years? Sometimes I did, not all the time. But you know, I've got those 22,000 pages of FBI files. <laughs> so they knew what, they knew what you were thinking, huh? <laughs> well, and you know, it's. You have to be reminded what you did, and then you have to remember what you were feeling. But if I forgot what I did, I'd just be able to, you know, turn to the FBI files. And, you know, I've, a lot of important times I kept a journal, yeah, in Vietnam and other times. Mm -hmm. um, you also, you already referred to um, your um, relationship with your dad. Mm -hmm. it, it runs as a thick red line throughout the book. He was the first uh, in a long line, no, in a, a line of men uh, that were emotionally... Um, uh, insufficient mm -hmm. and pointed out mm -hmm. and uh, ma made you think that you yourself was mm -hmm. insufficient mm -hmm. um, and you also pointed out that th his character Henry Fonda's character was so very different let me do that for you that Henry Fonda's character was so different from the type of roles that he played we know him as you mentioned as Tom Joad as mm -hmm. the, the, the no not so very different no no, I mean, my father was a Cold War liberal who voted for Truman. Mm -hmm. The character, you know, so he, he was a, a liberal, but the characters he played were radical. But it wasn't that, you know, it wasn't like he was... A cons How many... Okay, go into your hearts and be really honest. How many of you had fathers that didn't know how to express their emotions? Raise your hands. Tell the truth. I knew you were going to raise your hand. <laughs> Keep your hands up. I want, I want to just see. Yeah. You see, it's so common. It is. And they're not bad people, right? They're not bad. They just don't know how. Yeah. Well, he went one step further, I think, because he, say, he, he pointed out to, to you that he, fi he found feelings disgusting. As yeah, you, as you, right. As you. Um, well, he came well, from Holland. 
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, um, well, le let me phrase this in a, in a question. How did, of course, it's a very open question, because uh, I would like to ask how this affected your uh, experience in working with him near his death in, uh, on Golden Pond. Okay, imagine, all of you who raised your hand, okay? Imagine what a gift it was for me to produce a film for my father that I hoped would win him an Oscar before he died, in which I could play his daughter and say things to him that I couldn't say to him in life. And he won his Oscar five months before he died. Now just imagine how blessed am I to have been able to do that for my father. I mean, imagine if you could do something like that for your father. It's very fantastic. You know, and I write about how there was a scene, it's a scene that, I mean, even last night, there was a, it was shown in, in Amsterdam, this scene, and, and I start to cry because it just, it was so hard for me, the scene where I, where I have to say to him, I want to be your friend. And I wanted him to have emotion as well. And so I waited for his close-up, and I did something that he always hated. He didn't like anything to happen that hadn't been rehearsed. And I reached out, and I touched his arm, and he flinched, and tears came to his eyes, and he went like this. And if you look at the movie, you, you can see he, he ducks his head like this, but I saw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw. That's all you need. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's very interesting to read the book, not only, uh, uh, well, very interesting because it's, there are so many events. It's a good and, book. And it's a good book and it's a very, as I said, it's a very, it is. Uh, it's a very <laughs> colorful uh, and very American uh, uh, history also and very personal. Um, you you structured, it, structured it in three parts deliberately, acts, three acts, but yeah. it's also, three acts, yes, but it's also, it conforms to the, to the traditional uh, uh, form of a film script with the main character uh, changing profoundly and then at well, an idea. three quarter mm -hmm. uh, there's the crisis mm -hmm. with you um, and Ted, uh, well, your relationship was running aground mm -hmm. and then finally the, 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 uh, the, the climax The comes. problem is it couldn't possibly be a movie because there's too many really good scenes. <laughs> well, I could you cut know? out some. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, swimming naked with Greta Garbo, you know, you'd have to have that. In yes, you'd have to have Greta for that. Yes. You'd have to have when the girl pulled me into the manhole to escape the bombs in North Vietnam, yes, you know. I mean, yes. there's so many things yes. you'd have to have. That was one of the most moving scenes. Really? Isn't it I'd like to talk about that maybe, okay. later, maybe a bit later okay. on. Um, one, another thing that, that struck me is thinking about, about your life uh, and thinking about how you, uh, what you write and, and just said about how you have always had uh, men, you always had, had uh, what was it? The, the disease desire, to disease, please. To disease to please. Um, with all three of your husbands, well, Vadim is dead now, of course, but you remained very good friends. Does that tie in with that desire or, or not? Or is it just coincidence? It's wisdom. Well, well, it's well, wisdom. I, can, I buy that, but please look, explain. Well, look at the people who get towards the last act of their lives with the attitude, the world is full of assholes. You know, I'm the uh -huh. only one. It's his fault. It's her fault. He's the one that, uh-uh. The only way that you grow and evolve, which is the only thing that makes us different than chimpanzees and other animals, is that we have the ability to evolve. And the only way you do that is by owning your mistakes and by owning your failures mm -hmm. and understanding. I understand why things didn't work with my husbands. I also understand why I fell in love with them, but I know what role I played, too. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You have to forgive. Mm -hmm. Forgiving is the key thing. You cannot go through life angry and bitter. Otherwise, it's a bad ending. And you have to live preparing for your death, mm -hmm. I think, anyway. I think that's the way to live. That's also destructive to yourself, also. That's what I mean. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, you. I have, I have a lot of questions about the United States, about the present state of, about I'm the, state sure of the you Union. I'm sure you do. Uh -huh. um, uh, <laughs> but um, one of them, you, um, I was wondering how, how you, as the, the long-time partner of um, 
the man who, who laid the found no 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 who laid the foundation for one of the largest media conglomerates yeah. uh, uh, in the USA today, Time Warner, CNN. Yeah. How you look at the uh, position of the media in terrible. your country today? It's terrible. It's um, terrible. And could, do you tell Ted that it's terrible? He, he, they treated him so badly. He was the ultimate entrepreneur. He launched CNN. He created Turner Broadcasting. And because of the exigencies of capitalism, which I still don't understand, you have to always keep getting bigger. You know, it's never enough mm -hmm. to be what you are. You know, you always have to get bigger. And I kept saying, but Ted, why are you having to sell your company to this other company? Why don't you just, because he said, I'll be eaten up. Mm -hmm. I'll, there'll be a hostile takeover. And I watched it happen. So he got part of this bigger thing, and then these people, that have never started a company in their lives, who didn't have anywhere near the, the, the vision that he did, they got rid of him. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. He does not control CNN anymore. CNN know, is still know, a lot I, better I than, you know, than Fox. Uh, yes, okay, I'll grant, I'll grant him that, yes, yes. And he had good yeah. reason to have made an enemy of, of Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> uh, you, well, yes. I've, no, the media, no, no argument there. The media is being manipulated now in a way that it never happened during the Nixon administration. It's worse now. Don't you think there's a little change in the last couple of months after Cindy Sheehan's stand and after Katrina? Uh, well, there's a new movement growing. When I left, right well, before... Well, but there's also more attention to that in the media than there has been for two or three years. M maybe a little bit. At the same time, <laughs> you have the right-wing media making up lies about her. I mean, just... Mm -hmm. Lies. They don't care. They say she's been married several times and that her son, who died in Iraq, was the child of the first husband who left her and took the son and he raised the son. She's Cindy been married Sheehan, once. Cindy Sheehan, by the way, is the a woman who camped out of, uh, out of the, uh, at the ranch in Crawford. Uh, she's fabulous. A month, she's a fierce uh, during, warrior, working uh, class, well, while, sincere brave. While uh, George Bush was there. Everybody knows about the story? Yes. Yes, she's okay. fabulous, and she's been the spark that's reignited. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Good. Um, you mentioned Ted, Ted Turner and Catherine Hepburn uh, as the two most fascinating persons that you met in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Hepburn once said to you, remember, Jane, it's the woman who chooses the man and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Now, reading the part in which Ted Turner uh, uh, um, and you came together. I cannot believe that. He was perfect for me, but I know other women that, you know, that he didn't get, that he wanted, that he didn't get. I mean, you know, but he really came after me. He saw, when he saw the announcement of my divorce from Tom Hayden in the newspaper, he was flying on an airplane with somebody that he knew, and he said, this is the woman for me. This is the one. He knew. <sighs> <laughs> I love him very much, but it's, you know, I'm much better single. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about that, too, but later on. We have... How long is this going to go on? Oh. <laughs> um... About your movies, about one, one particular movie, the one, the, the one that was shown yesterday in Amsterdam, Clute. Mm -hmm. um, you write extensively in your book about the making of Clute, about the making of They Shoot Horses, Don't They, which mm -hmm. is one, one of my favorites, 9 to 5, and, and the one that I like best, uh, The China Syndrome. In Coming Home. In Coming Home, of course, yes, your second Oscar. I, I, I wrote a lot about that, too. Mm -hmm. The Battle of Penetration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I was particularly intrigued uh, by how you describe you prepared for your role in Clute. Uh, not only uh, you documented yourself in talking with, uh, with prostitutes, but it already started before that, you, you write. As I said, it, it's a very... You want uh, me to talk about the threesomes? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I, um, I, I, I hadn't finished my question yet. But I, yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. Okay. You talked with you. You spoke with. You know the how when I was up there, I talked about the disease to please and feeling I wasn't good enough. I thought long and hard about whether I was really going to show the extent to which I felt that I wasn't good enough. The extent to which a woman like me, independent, smart, all these things, could still betray myself 
in order to keep the man with me. My, my husband, Vadim, would bring other women in, 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 into the situation. And I, I, was, I didn't like it. I didn't dare say no because I thought he'd leave me. But what I would do, I didn't think about it consciously at the time, and I'm sorry that there, there's some elderly people here. I don't mean to be shocking. But the re I didn't write about it in a, in, a, in a salacious way. I wrote about it because I wanted to be clear about how far, how low I could get and how far I could come. Anyway, the women, afterwards sometimes in the morning, I would have coffee with the women. It was like an antidote to objectification. It allowed us for that time by ourselves to become two human beings. And I would, and sometimes, and these were call girl, high class call girls, and I wanted to know why. And what, you know, and I, I learned a lot from them. I never thought that it would serve me in a role I would play. Anyway, I came to New York to do Clute, and I asked the director, the wonderful Alan Pakula, to arrange for me to spend time with call girls and madams. It was quite something. I, I, it was sad. It was so sad. The women that I met were so hard. Life had hardened them, you know, had put such armor around their hearts. And I would go with them sometimes at night to, their, you know, the clubs that they, the pimps would meet them afterwards. And I would see what it was like when these prostitutes and the call girls and their pimps would be together. And the whole, it, it lasted a little bit over a week. Not one time did a pimp try to hit on me. Not even a wink. Mm -hmm. Not that I would have wanted one to, but what it said to me is, I'm no good for the part. These pimps know they can smell call girl material when they see one. Mm -hmm. They know this is a middle class girl, basically, and she is not for this thing. And it, it, I just thought, I can't do this. And I went to Alan Bakula and I said, please let me out of my contract. I can't do it. And I gave him a list of actresses that he should get. The top of the list was Faye Dunaway. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and he just laughed at me. He just laughed at me. And he told the story many times afterwards. And no, he said, no, you're going to do it. And then suddenly, I remembered these women that I had gotten to know. Some of them went on to marry corporate executives and royalty, and mm -hmm. some of them killed themselves. But some of them were, they were like my character. Mm -hmm. They were smart. They had that spark. You know, they were, they were hooking because they needed money for modeling or acting classes. You know, but they went on to be something. And so that's what I based my character on. Mm -hmm. That's the, what you wanted me to talk about. Yes, okay. and I, succeed, I think you succeeded very well in that. <laughs> um, the, the, if I had to choose two scenes in the book that I, that I will remember um, best, I think. The one is the, in which you describe how uh, Ted, Ted and you flew from, I think, L.A. to to Atlanta, <laughs> oh, God. and uh, he said, I mean, yeah, yeah, you yeah we got you? on his plane, I yeah, mean, you, you that's tried. a trip to be married to, well, we weren't married yet, but we were going steady, and he has this plane, and he said, you want, oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm, oh, you're not talking no. about that, oh, oh no, well, that's, a, that's almost okay, a salacious, okay, what, what's the one, the one that I, is at the end, where you, oh. where, this, where he said, well, I've, I've, decided to trade you in, basically, is what he said. And no, no, no. There's no. another woman waiting at... No, he didn't say that. Well, I no. found out. Oh, you did? Yeah, but beware of men who can't be alone. I was too smitten to see the red flags. And I'm talking about can't be alone at all. <laughs> it got real hard. <laughs> And another thing that I found out about him was that he had a great motto. It's a wonderful motto. Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. It's what won him the America's Cup as the greatest sailor in the world. It's what got him CNN. I mean, hope for the best, but always prepare for the worst. What I didn't think is how this would translate into our private lives. When he realized the marriage wasn't working, he started looking for my replacement. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it at the time. But when, when third day of the year 2000 and we landed in Atlanta and I got into my rented car to drive to my daughter's home, I found out later that the replacement 
My seat was still warm, and she got in the plane. That's, yeah. the, that's the sentence that I yeah. was, was wanting you to repeat. Um, the, uh, a huge jump now, because the other scene is the one uh, uh, during your first visit to uh, Vietnam, where there's uh, an alarm, American planes are coming over, and you jump into a manhole, which is a very, well, a, a very strange term in this context, with a Vietnamese girl. A manhole that was made for one man. Yeah. Can I tell the story? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. Um, we were, we'd, been, we'd driven about three hours south of Hanoi. This was 19, July 1972. It was, there was still bombing in the north, which is a very strange feeling when you're in a country and, that's being bombed by your country. And, and an amazing experience, especially since when the Vietnamese would see me. I'd be in a, in a shelter, in a bomb shelter, and the Vietnamese would see, I'm, you know, they thought maybe I was Russian or something, and they would ask my interpreter who I was, and he would say she's an American, and their faces would light up. Sometimes I'd want to shake them. Mm -hmm. Be angry at be me. Ang <laughs> yeah. Huh. No, there was never, it was amazing. I understood later, I understood why. Anyway, one day we were driving back from this city that had been destroyed and suddenly the driver said stop get out r quick I couldn't hear the plane because my ears weren't trained but the interpreter told me there's a plane coming and all along the side of the road everywhere there'd be a manhole it was like a hole straight down about the size for one person with a very thick straw lid that you could pull over the top to protect yourself from shrapnel and I, I, I was kind of running and I was grabbed from behind and it was this young Vietnamese girl, and I think she was a schoolgirl. She had a bunch of books on her back tied around with a rubber, black rubber belt. And she ran, pulled me along, and then took a, the top off, and there was a little straw hut, and she told me to get in, and then she got in. Now, th th this, is, this is not big enough for a, a, an American and a Vietnamese. Was, we were cramped. Her cheek, I could feel her breath. I could feel her eyelashes. We were scrunched together, and then the bomb started, and the ground shook. And I, you know, I just thought, this, this, this has to be a dream. I'm not in a hole with a Vietnamese girl who has just saved me from my country's bombs. I mean, anyway, eventually the bombing stopped, and she moved the lid back, and, and we got out, and... I got out and I said, I started crying and I said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I kept saying it over and over again and she started talking to me and I called the interpreter who'd been in another hole right over there to ask him what she was saying. And what she was saying was, don't be sorry for us. We know why we're fighting. It's you who don't know why you're here. The tragedy is yours. And, the other, and I, re, I saw the interpreter two years ago, and I said, was I dreaming? Did this really happen? Mm -hmm. It happened. And they couldn't have planned it. You know, I mean, they couldn't have arranged for it to happen. We didn't. Just incredible, this, this mm -hmm. manhole lesson from a 14-year-old Vietnamese schoolgirl. And... A couple of days later, they asked me to look at a play. It was Arthur Miller's play, All My Sons, which is a play that takes place during the Second World War. It's a man who runs a factory that makes parts for bombers, and he finds out that the parts that are being made are faulty and that could cause the crash of planes, and he doesn't say anything because he's greedy and he doesn't want to lose his government contract. One of his sons is a pilot, and he crashes. The other son condemns his father for his greed. This was being performed in Hanoi outside on a stage by Vietnamese actors. They wanted me to see it and critique it. The factory owner, who they called the capitalist, mm -hmm. had a polka dot bow tie, a yellow jacket, and two-tone saddle shoes. And they said, you know, is that the way he'd look? And I, I said, yeah, yes. <laughs> but it didn't really matter whether they were, it, what mattered was the fact that this play was being performed and I couldn't understand it. It was a traveling troupe of actors that would go into cities right after they'd been bombed. And I asked the director afterwards, why? 
And he said, one day the war will be over and we have to be friends, the United States and Vietnam. We have to be sure that our people understand it's not the American people. Mm -hmm. There are good Americans and bad Americans. We cannot hate you as a, you know, there was no Yankee go home or, and suddenly, oh, I understood the friendly faces then. You know, it wasn't that this is some special race of people. They were, there was this Herculean effort on the part of this enemy <laughs> to teach their people not to hate us. No wonder I came back a different person. I wouldn't have given up the experience that I had in North Vietnam for anything. Yeah, I made a mistake. You know, I don't. <laughs> I sat on an anti-aircraft gun without thinking, and I will die regretting that. Mm -hmm. Well, but you, you the actually you admit to two, two mistakes. Also, uh, later on, commenting on the, the prisoners. Yeah, coming God, back. Yeah, God, I was mad. <laughs> well, that's not. It's long ago. But well, one thing is interesting. The, there is still a lot of anger directed at you. Uh, from, from from some groups, but why do they hit on you and not on? Because I'm an easy Mohammed, target. Muhammad Ali, I mean, who how was dumb also can you get? Yeah, but he didn't sit on an anti-aircraft gun. And what's so interesting? He threw away is, his, his his medal in protest to, uh, to the. Uh, yeah, to, but to, I was Barbarella. They used uh -huh. to have my posters up in the military bases. Uh -huh. I betrayed them as a, an upper class white woman who was a sex symbol. Mm -hmm. the, and, and I was then photographed sitting on an anti-aircraft gun. It was mm -hmm. a Henry Fonda's daughter. I mean, it was thumbing my nose at a country that had brought me benefits. It was multi-layered betrayal, yep. which has been used by the right wing to create the myth of Hanoi Jane. They mm -hmm. need it. They need it. They need it now when people speak out against the war. Oh, be careful. You're going to be like Hanoi Jane. You're going to be a traitor. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. It's my fault. <laughs> um, there are a lot of parallels uh, uh, between the Vietnam War and the Iraq War, and you hint at them also in your book. Uh, now, I, at a certain point, you were planning a bus tour with Iraq vets uh, to, in protest against the Iraqi war. Uh, I understand that you stepped back. Yeah, that. because Cindy Sheehan is doing it, and she's better for mm -hmm. it than me. I, I'd be a distraction. There'd be too much of the Hanoi Jane thing. She's the right person to do it. <laughs> um, and besides, this is what the right wing does. When it became known that I was thinking about doing a bus tour, here's what the conservative reporters would say. Well, of course, she's old. Nobody cares about her anymore. She has to one more time get her name in the papers. You know, it's, eh. Well, you had your name in the papers uh, with another movie, Monster in Law. The Which was one, a big bomb in one, here. But it was a huge success in the America. The first one in 15 years, right? You stopped yeah. acting because of Ted. No, I no? stopped acting because I was someone who was living in my head. And you okay. can't be creative when you're living in your head. And I was miserable, and so I quit. Then I met Ted, and I didn't have to work. But a year or two years ago, I thought, well, I'm very different now. I'm going to see if I can have fun again making a movie. And I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only person that's ever had a number one book and a number one movie at the same time. Is it the number one movie now instead? Well, it was. It was. Oh, yeah, okay. It was. Good. Cheers to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that'll show them. That'll show them. <laughs> I have one or two more questions, but maybe um, it's time for the floor to see if there are any interesting questions that you might have to ask of Jane Fonda. It's your last chance for a while. So you have a step question? up to the mic. <laughs> step up to the mic. Or hand me a... Yes, gentleman over there. Hi. Hi. My name is Peter McCloskey, and I, you may recognize my accent. And perhaps my name, you, you've got me thinking about my father tonight. Oh, my gosh. And the Vietnam War in 1972. Yes. Perhaps you can answer a, a little family lore question for me. Yes. My father didn't talk about his emotions and feeling much, and he... I'm sure the crowd doesn't but know. But he was here, a poet. He, well, he he was a significant person in those days and an anti-war congressman. And he ran against Richard Nixon in '72 and right. got one electoral vote. But yes. and he never really talked about that to us. But he did tell us when he talks about the Miami Republican Convention right. in '72. Right. He doesn't tell us about giving passes to Vietnam. Uh, veterans in wheelchairs, but the, the story he tells us about is loaning his um, room keys 
to Jane Fonda and, and your husband. Tom Hayden. Tom Hayden at the time. And is that true or is that yeah. my father silliness it's speaking true. again? It's true. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That, that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> More questions. Oh, I was expecting a a crowd rushing to Somebody's the Somebody's got their hand up over there. Please walk up. Please walk up to the mic. Oh, Monique will come to you. Hello, my name is Shazia. I would like to ask a more political question because I read the interview with Sam Sharibi today in the Groene Amsterdammer and um, I was thinking about the purse that you talked about in the beginning, the purse that, as you say, will fill up the em or that, that girls buy to, because they think it will fill up the emptiness. Now what happens is that the, this image of girls buying purses in America um, it seems it's the, the, the image of happiness um, to a lot of women in the world. When you look at, for instance, I saw a documentary on black women in black music. When you see Mary J. Blige, what is she? She's buying Gucci and Versace and everything, and it seems it's her claim to fame and to happiness, and look what has happened. When you see people in the third world, I saw this incredible documentary on people about people in North Africa who look at the images of Rai Uno, where you see beautiful women and beautiful clothes and everything. And it, it really sort of draws them towards Europe, even if they know they can drown in the Mediterranean. I talked to an MP from the Green Party today who comes from Iran. Can, can and you people in Iran question, are again... Please? So my question is, because you say this, this thing, the Barbarella thing, the, the, the beautiful purse, the Vuitton and everything, is not bringing happiness, but everybody thinks it does. So what can we do to sort of find something, an, an, a new ideal, except Well, for that's the an purse. easy question. <laughs> How do we change the entire social paradigm in which we live right now? <laughs> It's, I mean, that's a very profound question. I, I think certainly one thing we can do is raise our daughters to feel loved unconditionally, to make them feel that no matter what they look like, it's fine, it's fine. That, that's, and we have to raise our sons. We have to pay very close attention when our sons are five or six years old, because this is when it happens to boys. We have to allow them to remain emotionally, Ill emotionally literate. We have to allow them to know that it's okay to have feelings and to love your mother and to cry and all these kinds of things. It's very hard for men in this world, not just for women, to stay in touch with their, you know, who, who, who they really are. It's, t you know, bule bulimia has hit Kenya. I heard about a girl in Kenya who had 90214, whatever the, the Beverly Hills zip code is, tattooed mm -hmm. on her arm. We're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. If that's your perceived necessity in life, to have that on your arm, yes. Yeah, but the women who do the shopping, listen, you know, I, I, I can see it right now. Since I don't live in Beverly Hills, when I go there, gosh, it's like... It being exposed to a different culture. And you can see, all you have to do is look in their eyes. They're not happy, but it's a way to numb the anxiety. You know, I, I know when you, when you are empty of spirit, you fill it with consumerism. We have to help our people get back to a core spirit. It doesn't have to be religion, but, you know, to, to strive to be complete instead of perfect. And that's a big job. It has to come from teachers and, and education and parents, 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 parents. Does that answer your question? And media. Because at one time we had people like Simone de Beauvoir and Marilyn French for role models, and now it seems that we have Paris Hilton and, and, and people like them. And it's a lot of attention put on celebrity, but there's also Eve Ensler and Gloria Steinem and me and, you know. And <laughs> Thank you.
Hello, my name's Joe Collins. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, I saw you, I think, about three months ago on the Jonathan Ross show, went out and booked the book. Bought, bought, bought the book? Bought, oh, good. Bought the book. Are you English? Away. I'm English, yeah. Um, thought it was absolutely wonderful. I've proceeded to tell he's everybody. He's a naughty boy, isn't about, he? He's great, yeah. He's, I really <laughs> like him, yeah. Um, and it I was, was a, me next to Motley Crue on a television show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was, <laughs> it was really weird. Um, after I read the book, which I thought was, was wonderful, also for me, maybe the, the most identification was with the political. I became politically active about the same time as you, so uh -huh. a lot of the things were very familiar and it felt good to read about it in your book. Um, but after I'd finished the book, I then got the film Coming Home, um, which I also thought was absolutely wonderful. I saw him years ago, but it was good to see it again. And the question I was like, you made this new film, uh, Monster in Law, I gather. It's, but I was wondering, why don't you make a film about what's happening now in Iraq? Because there seems to me to be very little... Um, Obviously, there's the news about what's going on in Iraq, and particularly in Europe, a lot of people in opposition to what's going on. But in the form of films where people can really form for themselves a picture of what it means well, to I'll be tell there you why. to be at home. I'm 68, just about 68 years old. Making Coming Home took six years. Okay. Um, making... Uh, the fastest one was Golden Pond, three years. I made one that was the, my favorite role. It took me 12 years. It takes a long time when you're developing a film from scratch. I don't have the time. As it is, it's not like people are banging on the door saying, oh, please be in our movie. You know, Hollywood doesn't like women with wrinkles. Uh, <laughs> and Golden Ponds don't come along all the time. I'm out of the business. I don't want to produce movies. If someone comes along with a part that can be fun, but they don't make movies like Coming Home anymore, mm. really. One of the things that probably struck you about that movie are the silences. When you see the old movies, and also in Clute, you know, there's space between words, mm. space between qu quietness between people, the way it is in life. Yeah. But you can't do that in movies anymore. It's just got to go real fast, because that's people's tension span is getting shorter and shorter. So, you know, those are, I'm too, I don't have a, pulse of the, what people want in movies now. And it is a market-driven business. You know, I don't want to make a movie that's not making money. I'm so glad Monster in Law, for all its silliness, did well in the States, you know? And I had a blast doing it. I learned how to play that part living with Ted Turner for 10 years. <laughs> I learned how to be outrageous and over the top and still lovable. <laughs> so you rule out producing another movie? But oh, do, yes. But do you rule out acting in, in another no, movie? No, no. If, you know, God, would I love to be in a movie that had something to say again? Yeah, but nobody's, you know, I, sometimes I'll get offered something, but they're so boring. Dour. It's hard to make a movie that's, that, that, that has a message that's meaningful that, that, that is a really good movie. I got lucky. I produced mm -hmm. 9 to 5, which was a very serious subject, in the context of a comedy. Mm -hmm. And it changed the lives of secretaries in America. China syndrome changed the way people thought about nuclear energy. On Golden Pond, you know, a lot of people saw it and then went and brought their fathers, and it changed their relationships. But those were unusual films because they were also successful financially. And if it was made in Europe instead of in America? Nobody's asked me. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, she just put, Maybe put, you should put, think put of one. Put out the I don't message. know. <laughs> oh, God, I what am I opening one. up? Yes, please, please walk up to the mic. I was wondering whether there was some kind of one of these Oscars Oh, my father won, won the Oscar by his own merits. Absolutely. It's just that I was lucky enough to discover this play, and I said, that's for... Of course he would have won his Oscar. It's just that I'm the one that produced the film for him. You know, I'm not sure that someone else would have, you know, put him in the film. I don't know. You know, but, but, huh? I don't want to take the credit for, no, he won the Oscar because he was brilliant. She just accepted the Oscar because he couldn't He was, up. I accepted it because he was too ill. Oh, 
Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank you. No. <laughs> no, no. There was one period, acting was never at the center of my life. There was one period of time when I was producing my own films that was beautiful. It was fabulous. But that, that only lasted for a certain number of years. It's, you know, if, so, if a film comes along, fine, but it's not going to be part of my third act, no. I mean, not, I may write about this if I write another book here at The Hague in this place in the John Adams, but I'm not going to worry about, in a film, it's not going to be what matters. Over there. Hi, my name is Michael Branca. I'm from the States, working here for six months at the Yugoslav Tribunal. Oh. I'm honored to be with you here, and I'm kind of emotional and hope I ask my question in an articulate fashion. Oh, who I was cares? very Just moved asking. by some of your earlier comments about a roadmap in our lives and how we're not given one when we're younger unless we play traditional roles. And you talked about filling the emptiness in your life in a different way as you got into this act. And I feel I've done that too later in my life. I got my political teeth in the Vietnam War, but I feel my personal journey now, I'm becoming more the person I want to be. And I, I appreciate the work you do with children to change life in the future in this way, but what comments could you give us about how to reach more people in our generation to see things more in this way? Big well, question. <laughs> that's a tall order. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your comments. It always interests me when men identify with, with my journey. It, you know, I didn't expect it, frankly. Um, I speak a lot in public. I travel around the country and I talk a lot to both young people and to their parents. That's what, what I do. And I, I have, there's a Jane Fonda Center at Emory University in Atlanta that trains adults who work with children, emergency room doctors, nurses, teachers, parents, um, physicians, and so forth, that train them. So we're trying to come at it from two directions. And I'm trying to create a model with what we're doing in Georgia that could be taken other places. It's very, it's very moving work. Maybe one or two more. Yes, the two gentlemen over there. Georgia, um, I have a question. What do you think of the prospects or chances of Hillary Clinton running for president? And what do you ah. think she could win? <laughs> um, Will you campaign for her too? You know, if she's the Democratic candidate, I would certainly campaign for her if she asked me. You know, they don't always ask me. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm frankly a little disappointed that Hillary is in favor of sending more troops to yes. Iraq. And I worry, I would love her to be the candidate, but I worry that because of the position she's taken on the war, as the war more and more loses favor among Americans, and Americans are looking for leaders that are courageous enough to, courageous enough to stand up and say, no, this is wrong, you know, that she's losing her base. So, you know, there's, listen, we're a very conservative country when it comes to strong women. There's a whole lot of people who don't like her. And I spend a lot of time in the middle part of America. So she needs her base. So if she's trying to move to the middle, you know, I'm worried that she's going to move to a place where people aren't going to fight for her. On the other hand, the Democratic Party is completely li lily-livered. <laughs> I yeah, don't know exactly who our leaders are. I'm going to say, uh, what, what else, who else are, I don't know. are they going to look for? Because there is no leader who stands up for Not yet, up against but we still Iraqi have a few war. years. See, yes. I think that because of Katrina, as well as the war, the next uh, mid, what we call midterm elections that will take place next November 2006, mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a change because of, of I mean, people were so shocked by Katrina. I can't tell you how deep that went. And now they're starting to look at the war differently. And I think that the Democrats will have a resurgence next November. Um, what that will mean in terms of new leaders coming forward, I, I don't know. So they may uh, win the majority in, in the House again? And ha I don't know, but I, I, would, I hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope. 
because it's real scary right now. Over there. Good evening. My name's Mindy Brown. I'm from America. I've lived here a long time, 46 years old. Um, I'm going to read your book. I'm sure I'll find it inspirational. I can see my vision of my relationship five years from now being the same that it is now. And I'm not feeling good inside about that. But I don't know how to find it in me to change that or... Yeah. Looking for a little guidance. Plus, I want to know what's your favorite film role, of course. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, hopefully reading my book will help you. You speak sign language? Yes. Yeah. Um, so do you, right? <laughs> I, 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 you know, I think reading my book might help. You know, it's hard to answer that question right now real quick at this time. My favorite role, actually, my very favorite person that I played is a, something that you've never seen here. I did it for television, and it was a woman... A, a, a hillbilly, a woman from Appalachia during the Second World War, and I just, I loved her. That's the one that took 12 years to get it right. And, and next to her, I love Brie Daniel in Clue. I like playing her. And then I created the character that I played in Coming Home, and I really liked her, too. Lady over there. You, uh, Are you Dutch? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> shall, I, yeah, shall I ask you a question in, in, in Dutch? No. <laughs> well, we were wondering, you were spending so much time doing so many things. Do you spend a lot of time with your children and grandchildren? Yeah. Uh, and what do you do for I them? Love, well, we have this in common. We love being grandparents. <laughs> Nobody prepared do me. Do you find the time to spend a lot of I time? I do. My, my, my daughter and grandchildren live in Atlanta, about five minutes from my house. And they were just in Paris with me. Um, and my son is making a movie in London, so he came to Paris too. So, you know, we, we spend a lot of time together, yes. And I'm not, you know, this is, it's like you gird your loins. Okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to, I believe in this book and I want it to be read by people. And then it'll be over. And then I'll go home and I'll be with my kids again, you know. Read the last chapter in the book, the last chapters. There's a lot about family life in there. Yes, lady over there. Hello, hello. my name is Ellen Cruza. I'm an American, married to a Dutchman, so half half. Um, I wanted to know, I, actually I've been very concerned about the media for a long time, and I just wonder if you or Mr. Turner perceive any way that there will be better, more accurate reporting, and what can be done. Can there be a new CNN who actually reports uh, more accurate news to the U.S.? Well, can there be more accurate news? A group of women, including myself and Gloria Steinem and Robin Morgan and Jessica Newworth and a bunch of others, are forming a women's radio network. Yes. That will be owned by women. But they listen to radio. Yeah, um, but we, we want to do a radio show that is aimed at a, the target audience is not the convinced feminists. We want to do what I try to do in my book, bring people along. Um, I don't know if we can, what we can do about the media. I know one thing that my organization does. We are developing a curriculum to inoculate young people against the media. If you teach young people, if you expose to young people what the media is doing, how it plays on our anxieties, how it plays on our body images, how it fools with our heads, it's like inoculating them. It allows them to see it in a political way. It allows them to step back and view it from a distance. It's called social inoculation theory, and we're we're developing a, a, a curriculum for that. So, you know, huh, until, we, until we can change the media, and Ted doesn't know how to do it either. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 in practical terms, are you going to cooperate with uh, NPR, for instance, in technical um, terms? No, no? it's, no. It's totally independent. Well, we'll, we'll do some things with Radio America, some, you know, but it, it, will be, um, it will be different. It will be livelier and spunkier than NPR, mm -hmm. even NPR. You know, national public radio has come under such attack and it depends on, um, 
you know, kind of like the John Adams Institute. It's mm -hmm. part private money and part public money. Yes. And the conservatives running the government are trying to defund it. And so it's having to move to the middle, and, and it's such yes, a shame. Their fundraisings are getting longer and longer and longer and longer. <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, yes, over there. The gentleman in the shirt. And then the gentleman over there. Hello. I'm wondering if you could uh, give me some, some of your opinions of what's right with America today and what strengths, what do you, what do you think America has going for it yeah. today? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, do you, do you? It's a fantastic country. Still, we have in our country a fluid class system. It is still possible, not as much as it was you know, in the 50s when I first came to Europe and realized how different Europe is than America, that you can come up from the bottom and make something of yourself with a little luck, with good parents and an education. You can betray your class which is not so true in, in, in other parts of the world. There's an energy because of that in America that is, that is quintessentially American. Um, we're, we're, we, we, are, we're, we, we have an energy from the heart that is very nice. Uh, maybe not quite as much as what I felt here in, in Holland, frankly. Um, I mean, I feel like you're all saints or something. Everybody is so sweet. Everybody. <laughs> um, but, but we we are um, hospitable, especially when you get out into the real country. You know, away from the from the coastlands. We're. Um, it's a beautiful country. You know, I, I describe when I started discovering how beautiful it is. I said I, I would like to try to help make our moral beauty as, as beautiful as our physical beauty. And we're so huge and diverse. There's so many different kinds of people there. Um, it, it's, uh, but I, I think it's the class fluidity that's the most important, although that's starting to go mm -hmm. and it makes me very sad. Thank you. The gentleman over there sitting there, yes. That's uh, my name is Heng Bishop. Uh, may I go back shortly to the Vietnam area, because at that time it made a great impression on my life too. Uh, I was just wondering how you, as a young woman, I think you were at around your 30s at that time, uh, and living in fortunate circumstances, how did you originally came to the conclusion that this was an unjust war, and uh, was that after your visit to North Vietnam or the, um, the U.S. Army? I'm just very much interested to know how. Secondly, you mentioned the Tonkin incident when it was presented at the time. Did you realize at that time that it was a set-up affair, or did you later realize it? Mm -hmm. To answer the second question, I didn't realize that it was a set-up affair until much later when we read the secret documents. Well, I have uh, Stone pointed it out quite soon after the incident that it was a hoax. Um, but the proof came when we actually read the internal documents. Uh -huh. I was living in Paris. It was 1968. And I was contacted by American soldiers who, had, who were resisting the war from inside the military. This was an eye-opener for me. They had been there. They told me what it was like, and they gave me a book called The Village of Ben Sook. That's the first thing that opened my eyes, that kind of removed the blinders and let me see the reality of Vietnam. And when I went back home, I worked with American soldiers um, in the military and then with Vietnam veterans like John Kerry who were opposed to the war. That's really how I got into the anti-war movement. It's 9.30. We promised you that you would be home in Amsterdam in your hotel. I have a last question mm -hmm. reserved for myself, mm -hmm. um, and that's you, you, it's a frivolous question. Well, it's a serious question too. You send out uh, conflicting uh, signals. I read two newspaper reports uh, back to back uh, today. In the first one you said that you cannot imagine there being another man in your life. And in the second, on a yesterday at a press conference, you asked if there were perhaps any interesting singles in Amsterdam. 
Which of the two is true? No, I didn't say that I can't imagine there being a man in my life. I hope there would be another man in my life because I can't, I think that I've really changed, um, but I can't really know living with a dog. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what I said was I can't imagine marriage. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for being so candid. <laughs> What an inspirational talk, I think, for the first time here in The Hague. Her first time, and I think she loved the audience, and I loved you too. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Huh? So hope for the best, there are drinks downstairs. I'm afraid she's not here anymore to sign books, but please stay a little longer. Um, know that we will be back in The Hague. It's it takes a little while, the 7th of December, something completely different in a different location, but the Prime Minister will be there, Balke and, uh, and Amitai Etzioni, and a very nice program, you'll hear about that later on. Um, for now, thank you very much for coming. I hope to see you all again, and take up some notes from the John Adams Institute, some leaflets, and become a member, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much for coming. Applause